As a dedicated software developer from a bustling city, I decided to take a business trip to a quiet town on the rural edges of the county. I booked a picturesque Airbnb, nestled in the shadow of the county's thickly wooded hills, which seemed ideal for a peaceful week of work. Upon my arrival, I was greeted by Mark, the host. His charm was as welcoming as it was slightly intense. The cottage itself was beautifully maintained, complete with an enchanting garden and a view that overlooked the serene county landscape. Not However, I soon noticed that the nearest neighbors were uncomfortably distant, and the town itself seemed unusually quiet. This isolation, though initially appealing for its peace, began to stir a slight unease in me as the days passed. During the initial days, Mark's hospitality seemed impeccable. He prepared home-cooked meals with ingredients sourced from the local county markets and regaled me with stories of the town's history. However, my comfort began to erode as his actions hinted at an unsettling attentiveness. One afternoon, I returned to find a vintage postcard of the county on my bed. It was a card I had never seen before, one I certainly hadn't purchased or expressed any interest in. The realization dawned on me that Mark had been entering my room in my absence. The issue of privacy intrusion deepened one evening when I discovered that my bedroom door wouldn't lock from the inside. I brought it up with Mark, who responded with a casual air, brushing off my concerns as he promised to fix it soon. But as days passed, that promise was conveniently forgotten. Each of these instances chipped away at my sense of security, replacing the initial charm of the cottage with a growing dread. His intrusions, though subtle, started to paint a clearer picture of a boundary being intentionally crossed. Each night, as I lay in that unlocked room, the isolation of the cottage in the vast county no longer felt serene, but ominous, making me acutely aware of how alone I truly was. Mark's behavior became more erratic by the day, transforming my unease into genuine fear. His messages began to arrive late at night, each one asking how I enjoyed exploring the county, his words probing subtly into the personal details of my life. It became clear that staying was no longer safe. I made the decision to leave, telling Mark that a sudden work emergency required my immediate return home. His reaction was telling. His face tightened with displeasure, yet he nodded, ostensibly accepting my decision. That night, I quietly packed my things with a plan to leave at first light. The once comforting solitude of the cottage now felt oppressive, and each creak and whisper of the wind through the trees heightened my anxiety. I was ready to escape at dawn, hoping to leave behind the unsettling experience of being watched too closely in this remote part of the county. My heart sank as I realized that my door had been locked from the outside. In a panic, I checked my phone. No signal. The Wi-Fi was down as well. It seemed all my lines to the outside world had been deliberately cut. With no other exit options, I turned to the window. Climbing through with a mix of fear and urgency, I dropped into the chilly air of the county's moonlit garden. To my horror, Mark was there waiting, his figure emerging from the shadows. He approached his expression a disturbing mix of desperation and affection as he confessed his feelings. We're meant to be together forever, he said, his voice oscillating between pleading and menacing. The garden, once a quaint feature of the Airbnb, now felt like a stage for a sinister revelation. His words, meant to be declarations of love, sounded more like threats as the moon cast eerie shadows around us. Trapped and desperate, I knew I had to play along with Mark's delusions to buy myself time. I reluctantly agreed to his plan of spending the day together, touring the county. Throughout the day, I managed a forced smile and nodded along to his chatter, while my eyes darted around, constantly searching for an opportunity to seek help. We visited a local cafe, a quaint spot that seemed a slice of normalcy, and there I spotted a public phone. It was a potential lifeline yet Mark's presence was suffocatingly close. He watched my every move with an intensity that made it impossible to reach out without arousing his suspicion. Each minute with him tightened the knot of anxiety in my chest as I feigned interest in his stories, all the while feeling the weight of his gaze pinning me in place. That night, I waited until I was sure Mark was asleep, and then I made my move. Silently, I slipped out to the cafe, 
my heart hammering in my chest with every step. The public phone was my only hope. I quickly dialed 911, but as I whispered my location into the receiver, a chilling realization set in. I was being followed. Mark had noticed my absence and was now in hot pursuit. I dropped the phone and ran through the empty county streets, his shouts haunting the night air behind me. My breaths were sharp and desperate as I sprinted toward the faint lights of an approaching police car. Just as the lights came into clear view, Mark caught up, grabbing my arm. I screamed for help at the top of my lungs, my voice breaking through the quiet night, finally catching the attention of the officer. The police intervened quickly, responding to my screams. They swept through the Airbnb and made a horrifying discovery. Hidden cameras were embedded in the clocks and a disturbing collection of recordings were unearthed. It wasn't just me. There were other guests in these videos, all unwitting victims of Mark's obsession. He was arrested on the spot. The local county police escorted me to a safe place, assuring me of their support through this ordeal. Months later, as I began to heal, an unsettling message arrived from an unknown account, a picture of me smiling at the county cafe during my attempted escape. The caption chillingly read, Miss you already. Instantly, my past fears resurfaced, hinting that my nightmare might not be over yet. I arrived at the Airbnb just as the sun began to set, casting a warm golden glow over the quiet suburban neighborhood. The house looked perfect, a charming two-story home with a well-kept garden and a cozy front porch. I took a deep breath, feeling the stress of my business trip begin to melt away. This place seemed like the perfect retreat after long days of meetings. I found a welcome note taped to the front door from my host, Alex. Make yourself at home, Jake. Sorry I couldn't be there to greet you. Enjoy your stay. The note was friendly, but I couldn't shake the odd feeling that something was off. I shrugged it off, chalking it up to my usual travel jitters. As I settled in, I met a few of the neighbors. They were friendly enough, but there was a nervous energy about them. Mrs. Thompson, the elderly woman next door, seemed particularly anxious. She watched me with wary eyes as I unloaded my bags. Are you staying at Alex's place? She asked, her voice trembling slightly. Yes, I am, I replied, smiling. He seems nice, though I haven't met him yet. Mrs. Thompson's expression darkened. Just be careful, dear. Strange things have been happening around here since he disappeared. Disappeared, I echoed, surprised. She nodded, leaning closer. Alex hasn't been seen for over a week. People are talking. Just be cautious, okay? I thanked her for the warning, but brushed it off as small town gossip. After all, I was here to focus on my work, not to get caught up in local mysteries. As I closed the door behind me, though, a shiver ran down my spine. Little did I know Mrs. Thompson's warning was just the beginning. As the days passed, I began to notice strange occurrences that set my nerves on edge. A black car was parked down the street for hours, its occupants obscured by tinted windows. Shadowy figures seemed to linger just out of sight, disappearing whenever I tried to get a closer look. It was as if I were being watched. One morning, I decided to check Alex's mailbox. It was stuffed with unopened letters and packages, some of which looked weeks old. Something was definitely wrong. Curiosity peaked. I searched the house more thoroughly, hoping to find some clue about Alex's whereabouts. In the back of a closet, I stumbled upon a hidden compartment. Inside was a worn journal, its pages filled with frantic, paranoid scribblings. Alex had been terrified. The entries detailed his fear of a dangerous loan shark named Victor. There were cryptic references to a package that Alex was supposed to deliver but had somehow lost. The more I read, the more I realized how deep in trouble Alex had been. That evening, as I tried to make sense of the journal, my phone buzzed with an anonymous text message. Leave now, or you'll regret it. My blood ran cold. Who was watching me? What had I gotten myself into? Determined not to be intimidated, I decided to stay, hoping to uncover more about what had happened to Alex. But the threats escalated. 
One night, I stepped outside to find my rental car's tires slashed. A note was pinned under a windshield wiper. You're next. Fear gripped me. This was no longer just an unsettling mystery. It was a dangerous game, and I was caught in the middle. The sense of isolation grew as I realized I couldn't trust anyone. Every shadow, every unexpected sound sent my heart racing. I had to figure out what happened to Alex before it was too late. Feeling increasingly unsafe but driven by curiosity and a sense of justice, I knew I couldn't just walk away. Alex's disappearance was too troubling, and I felt compelled to uncover the truth. During one of my cautious ventures outside, I met Lisa, a neighbor who seemed genuinely concerned and aware of the strange happenings. She was a bit younger than me, with an air of quiet determination. Have you noticed anything strange around here? I asked her one afternoon. Lisa nodded, glancing around nervously. Alex was a friend. When he disappeared, I knew something was very wrong, but people around here are too scared to talk. We decided to team up, pooling our knowledge and resources. Lisa's insights into Alex's life and my findings from the journal made us a good pair. While poring over the journal, we found a reference to a storage unit, a place where Alex had hidden something important. Armed with this clue, we searched the house and found a small, rusty key tucked away in the back of a drawer. The label on it matched the storage unit number mentioned in the journal. With a mix of trepidation and determination, we decided to check it out. The storage unit might hold the answers we were looking for, clues about the mysterious package, and perhaps even Alex's whereabouts. As we headed to the storage facility, the danger was palpable, but there was no turning back now. At the storage unit, Lisa and I held our breaths as we lifted the creaky, rusted door. The unit was cluttered with old furniture and boxes, but it didn't take long to spot the package mentioned in Alex's journal. It was a battered briefcase, inconspicuous yet oddly foreboding. We opened it and gasped. Inside were stacks of cash and a collection of documents implicating several local officials in illegal activities. Holy crap, Lisa whispered her eyes wide with fear. This is what got him into trouble. Before we could fully process the gravity of our discovery, we heard footsteps. The door slammed shut behind us, and we turned to see Victor and his men blocking our only exit. Their faces were cold, menacing. Well, well, look what we have here, Victor sneered. Did you really think you could just waltz in and take that? Panic surged through me, but I forced myself to stay calm. We need to get out of here, I whispered to Lisa. In a split-second decision, we used the clutter to our advantage, toppling shelves and boxes to create a barrier. Amid the chaos, we slipped past Victor's men and bolted for the exit. The chase was on. We sprinted through the dark, deserted streets, our breaths ragged with fear and exertion. Victor and his men were close behind, their shouts echoing in the night. My heart pounded as we dodged into narrow alleys and jumped over fences, desperate to escape. Finally, we found refuge in an abandoned building. We ducked inside, our backs against the cold, damp wall. The footsteps and shouts grew distant, and we dared to hope we'd lost them, at least for now. This isn't over, Lisa panted, clutching the briefcase tightly. But we can't stop. We need to expose them. We can't keep running, Lisa said. We need help, real help. With a shaky breath, I used a burner phone we'd found in the storage unit to contact Victor. Pretending to be desperate, I told him we wanted to strike a deal for the safe return of the package. Victor, suspicious but intrigued, agreed to meet us at a secluded location later that night. While we waited, I secretly contacted the police, explaining our situation and the evidence we had. The officer on the other end was skeptical at first, but agreed to send a team to the meeting point. As the night wore on, we arrived at the designated spot, an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. The place was eerily quiet, the perfect setting for a confrontation. Victor and his men arrived shortly after, their expressions a mix of anger and curiosity. I could see the greed in Victor's eyes as he spotted the briefcase. Let's get this over with, he growled. Unbeknownst to Victor, the police were lying in wait. The tension was unbearable but we had to see it through. This was our chance to end the nightmare and bring justice for Alex. As we stood in the abandoned warehouse, the tension was palpable. 
Victor's eyes darted around suspiciously, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. You really thought you could outsmart me? Victor sneered, a sinister smile creeping across his face. I knew about the police the moment you called. My heart sank as Victor's men stepped out of the shadows, guns drawn. It was a trap. We were surrounded. Just as we thought we were cornered, the sound of sirens filled the air. The police had arrived, tracking my phone as planned. A tense standoff ensued, the police shouting orders and Victor's men hesitating. Victor's face twisted with rage as he realized his plan was falling apart. Drop your weapons, an officer commanded. Victor's men wavered and, in the moment of hesitation, the police moved in, swiftly disarming and arresting them. Victor was dragged away, his eyes burning with hatred. Breathing heavily, Lisa and I clung to each other, the briefcase still in our possession. The nightmare was finally over. Victor was in custody, and the evidence we'd risked our lives for was safe. Are you okay? A police officer asked, helping us to our feet. We are now, I replied, relief flooding over me. The danger had passed, but the memory of that night would stay with us forever. Months later, just as life seemed to be returning to normal, I received an anonymous message. It was a photo of Lisa and me during our recovery, captioned, We'll be watching. My blood ran cold. The message was clear. Some of Victor's associates were still out there, and the danger was far from over. I arrived at the picturesque Airbnb, nestled in a remote location, looking forward to a relaxing getaway. After a long drive, I was eager to unwind. My name is David, a solo traveler with a penchant for seeking out the quieter, more secluded spots. The place was even more beautiful than the pictures had shown. A charming house surrounded by lush greenery, offering the perfect escape from city life. As I pulled into the driveway, Emily and Tom, the hosts, came out to greet me. Emily, in her early 40s, had a warm smile and a calming presence. Tom, slightly younger, seemed overly eager to please, almost as if he was trying too hard to make a good impression. Despite this, they both made me feel instantly at home. We're so glad you're here, Emily said, helping me with my bags. You must be tired from the drive. Let us show you around. At first, everything seemed perfect. Emily and Tom were incredibly accommodating, making sure I had everything I needed. But it didn't take long for me to notice that Tom's friendliness was bordering on intrusive. He asked a lot of personal questions and seemed overly interested in my plans and background. While Emily was more reserved, Tom's eagerness to befriend me felt unsettling. The first night, after a pleasant dinner with the hosts, I settled into my room. As I was about to fall asleep, I heard muffled voices coming from the kitchen. I couldn't make out the words, but the tone was unmistakable, an intense argument. Curiosity got the better of me, so I quietly crept out of my room and down the hall. I stood near the kitchen door, straining to hear. Emily's voice was anxious, almost pleading, while Tom's was low and menacing. We can't afford another mistake, Tom, Emily said. What happened to the last guest can't happen again. I felt a chill run down my spine. What did she mean by that? Was it just a misunderstanding, or was there something more sinister at play? I decided it was best to stay cautious. I didn't want to jump to conclusions without more information. Over the next couple of days, I kept my interactions with Tom and Emily polite but guarded. I observed them closely, looking for any signs that might confirm my growing suspicions. Tom's behavior became even more peculiar. He seemed to always be watching me, his eyes following my every move. Emily, on the other hand, seemed increasingly tense as if she was walking on eggshells around Tom. I knew I had to investigate further, but I couldn't let them know I was onto them. I needed to find out what had really happened to the previous guest, and if I was in any danger myself. One evening, I noticed a small, inconspicuous device tucked away in the corner of the room. Upon closer inspection, I realized it was a hidden camera. A surge of panic washed over me as I quickly scanned the room discovering two more cameras expertly hidden. They had been watching my every move. 
I knew I had to act carefully. Pretending everything was normal, I decided to explore the house while Emily and Tom were distracted in the garden. As I wandered through the hallways, I came across a door that was always locked. It piqued my curiosity. Why would they keep it locked? Determined to find out, I searched for a key. In one of the closets, I stumbled upon a small metal box. Inside, I found the key, along with something even more disturbing. A notebook. Flipping through its pages, I saw detailed entries about previous guests, all written by Tom. Each entry started pleasantly enough, but gradually turned dark. The final entries for each guest described their fear, desperation, and ultimately, their abrupt disappearance. My heart pounded in my chest. This was proof that something terrible had happened to the previous guests. Tom's disturbing fascination and Emily's anxious behavior suddenly made horrifying sense. I had to get out of there, but I knew my every move was being watched. The notebook's last entry, dated just a week ago, ended ominously. David is next. With my heart racing, I decided to leave immediately. I packed my things as quietly as possible and headed out to my car, only to find the engine wouldn't start. After a quick inspection, I realized the wires had been tampered with, making escape impossible. Panicking, I went back inside to confront Emily, clutching the notebook as evidence. Emily, what is this? I demanded, thrusting the book in her direction. Her eyes widened in shock, but she quickly masked it with a calm facade. I don't know what you're talking about, David. That notebook must be a mistake, she said, her voice trembling slightly. Tom likes to write stories. Maybe he wrote those for fun. There's nothing to worry about. I could see through her lies. The fear in her eyes was real. Stories? I repeated, trying to keep my voice steady. They don't seem like fiction to me, Emily. She continued to feign ignorance, but I could tell she was scared. Everything is fine, David. You're safe here. Just relax and enjoy your stay. I pretended to believe her, forcing a smile. Okay, maybe I'm overreacting, I said, trying to sound convinced. I'll let it go. But inside, I knew I had to find another way out. I couldn't trust either of them, and the house was filled with hidden dangers. My every move had to be calculated. I decided to continue playing along while secretly planning my escape. The only way out was to outsmart them and find help before it was too late. Desperate for a way out, I knew I had to get help, without alerting Emily and Tom. I slipped my phone into my pocket and excused myself to the bathroom. Once inside, I locked the door and quickly texted my friend, Mark. I shared my location, details about the hidden cameras, the tampered car, and the disturbing notebook entries. Mark, you need to get the police here. I'm in serious trouble. This place isn't safe, I wrote, my fingers trembling. Mark's response came almost immediately. Stay calm. I'm on my way and will contact the authorities. Hang tight. With a slight sense of relief, I knew help was on the way, but I still had to maintain the facade until they arrived. I rejoined Emily and Tom in the living room, forcing myself to smile and engage in casual conversation. Every moment was nerve-wracking, but I couldn't let them sense my fear. Thanks for being so hospitable, I said, pretending to be relaxed. This place is amazing. Tom seemed to buy my act, though I could tell Emily was still on edge. My heart pounded with every second that passed, hoping Mark and the authorities would arrive before my true intentions were discovered. I continued to play along, making small talk and pretending to enjoy my stay, all the while feeling like I was walking on a razor's edge. Tom's behavior escalated quickly as he began to sense my growing distrust. His once overly friendly demeanor turned dark and intimidating. He dropped subtle threats into casual conversations, and his eyes rarely left me, adding a chilling tension to the atmosphere. As the evening wore on, I excused myself under the pretext of needing some air and made my way to the basement. My hands shook as I unlocked the door. Inside, the grim reality hit me hard. Bloodstains smeared on the floor, and personal belongings of previous guests were scattered around. Each item was a silent testament to their horror. 
While examining the horrifying scene, I heard footsteps. Tom stood at the basement door, blocking my only exit. His face twisted into a menacing grin. Looking for something, David? He asked, his voice cold and threatening. Panic surged through me. But I remembered the small knife I had found in my room earlier and had instinctively pocketed. As Tom advanced towards me, his intentions clear, I pulled out the knife. A struggle ensued, fierce and desperate. I managed to push him back, and with a surge of adrenaline, I shoved him into a small room in the basement, slamming the door and locking it. Breathing heavily, I leaned against the door, my heart pounding in my chest. Tom banged against the door, shouting threats, but the lock held. I knew I had to leave before he found a way out. This was my chance to escape and alert the authorities before it was too late. Just as I steadied my breath, the sound of sirens pierced the air, and within moments, police cars flooded the property. Mark had arrived with them, pointing the officers towards the house. Emily rushed out, her expression one of panic, as she attempted to spin a story of misunderstanding. Despite her efforts, the police, already briefed by Mark about the situation and the evidence I'd found, were not swayed by her lies. They moved past her and into the house, where I emerged from the basement, leading them to where Tom was still locked up. Tom was apprehended amidst a barrage of threats and curses, his anger palpable, even as he was handcuffed. The officers conducted a thorough search of the house, uncovering the full extent of Emily and Tom's crimes. The belongings and evidence in the basement painted a clear picture of the numerous guests who had vanished. Emily, unable to maintain her facade any longer, broke down and was taken into custody. Standing outside, watching the chaos unfold, I felt an immense rush of relief wash over me. I was safe, finally rescued from the clutches of this nightmare.